Welcome everyone. Glad you could join me live here. I got the um, PowerPoint set up. If um, you can see it, please uh, comment for me so I know that uh, you're able to see the PowerPoint okay. If you're just joining on to the live session, please just uh, comment if you can hear me. That way I know everything's working okay. Um, I think the audio should be working now. Are you guys uh, able to hear me? Brittany says she can see it. That's great news. Can you guys hear me? I just, uh, I think I had to set up my microphone and uh, I think I just did, but okay, great. Uh, this is wonderful. I'm glad everything's working how it's supposed to. It's a miracle when technology works. So thanks for, for joining everyone. Um, I'm grateful that I have the support. Um, and uh, I'm actually sitting in my car, as you probably noticed, and I'm in, um, well, I'm outside of an AT&T wireless store that's closed, but the Wi-Fi is working. And so uh, I decided to come out here uh, because my internet connection is not very good where I live. So, um, I'm here in my car, and uh, I actually have a really good internet connection where I am, so I think things should work out okay. My battery is low on my laptop, though, so um, hopefully that won't be an issue. All right. Well, again, I just wanted to let you guys know that um, uh, I'm doing this um, to help you. And so um, whatever questions you have, type this those into the, the chat and I'll, I'll answer those after we're finished today. Um, and uh, we'll hopefully get some time to answer those afterwards. So let's go ahead and review what we talked about last time. Um, I mentioned drinking water. Of course, we wanted, uh, we saw that study that uh, drinking water can actually lead to, to weight loss in that study with women that we saw where they drank uh, equal to or greater than one liter of water per day. Um, also, I, I mentioned cutting out the sodas, cutting out the sugary drinks and these kind of things, uh, added sugar, because uh, Americans eat 100 pounds of added sugar per year on average, and we determined that that could be about 50 pounds of, of weight. Also, uh, I talked about uh, fiber and, and how uh, beneficial fiber is, trying to eat higher fiber foods first, hence eat an uh, apple a day, um, and uh, that can help you to lose weight. And also there's a plethora of other health benefits as well. And then lastly, we talked about how it's important to eat a big breakfast. 
uh, every day. Um, as we saw those two groups of people, one that ate, uh, one group of people that ate a smaller meal for breakfast, and another group that ate a larger meal for breakfast with a um, smaller dinner compared to the other group that ate a, a bigger dinner, and they ate the same amount of calories, but the group that had a bigger breakfast and a smaller dinner actually lost weight and had other health benefits as well uh, with their triglyceride levels, their waist circumference, and um, the, the, the group that actually ate a larger dinner and a smaller breakfast, they actually had an increase in their triglycerides even though they lost weight. Um, so eating breakfast is very important. Uh, today we are going to talk about a few things. For one, we're going to talk about fad diets, um, and I'm going to focus on low-carb diets. Then I'm going to talk about useful dietary principles for optimal health. And um, I'm going to talk about reading labels as well. I'm not going to talk about shopping on a budget, even though it's on that list. I forgot to take that off. Um, uh, but we can talk about that if you'd like in the future. Um, I did want to mention that, uh, the video from last time, I, uh, meant to mention this, uh, earlier, but, uh, the, the video from last time, uh, is posted on YouTube, and under that I did post a link for the PowerPoint presentation since I wasn't able to get that working, uh, so if you wanted to, uh, view that, you could. Um, on um, YouTube when you see that video there. All right. Well, let's go ahead and get started here um, with the presentation. So this is a uh, timeline I thought was um, pretty interesting on a website I found that just explain some of the history of low-carb diets. And the first one that they have on there is the, uh, the cabbage soup diet. <laughs> and uh, that uh, apparently consisted of just eating as much cabbage soup as you want. And uh, of course you're going to lose weight doing that. Um, and uh, this is something that I guess people are still doing. I guess you can eat soup with vegetables and different things in it, but there's not much to it as far as I understand. Uh, just eating as much cabbage soup as you want. Um, then we get to this, the paleo diet, um, and uh, um, I guess there's been different times when that's been introduced, but uh, just a breakdown of the paleo diet, it's sort of considered the... Uh, hunter-gatherer diet. Um, the concept is eating the diet of our ancestors um, in a diet that's lower with uh, refined carbohydrates and sodium and higher in fiber and protein. And actually it's comparable in fat and cholesterol to the typical diet today. Also it included more physical activity. Um, uh, hence the idea that they thought that um, people were just naturally more active when they ate this type of diet. And um, basically the diet consists of lean meats, fish, vegetables, fruits, nuts, and seeds, and um, limits food from food when, when we started uh, kind of the agricultural revolution, kind of eating foods before all the agricultural foods that we eat today were, were available, such as dairy and legumes and grains and other processed foods, so they don't eat as, as much of those. Now, you know, this diet, is, they have some good principles in it, actually, eating more whole foods, uh, fruits and vegetables, nuts and seeds, those are, those are good things. Um, but actually, I, I recently watched it's interesting. I watched a doc, a, um, 
I didn't watch the whole thing, but I watched some of Dr. Uh, Christina Warriner, uh, who is an anthropologist who went to Harvard, and uh, she actually debunks this paleo diet myth, saying that our ancestors ate this way. Uh, she's saying we're actually more designed to eat an omnivorous diet, our, the way our teeth are, the way that we are made. So, uh, so she kind of debunks that myth. If you're interested, there's a link uh, on the slide there to that. Uh, on this timeline, and then it goes in 1992 to the, the Atkins diet. He actually, Dr. Atkins actually introduced it earlier than that, but I guess there was this new Atkins revolution or something uh, introduced later. But um, in short, his from what I understand, his original diet plan was two weeks of 20 grams per day of carbohydrates. And then you slowly increase that five grams per week and stop increasing when you get to about 40 or 90 grams per day. Uh, the current plans are a little bit different um, where there's there's different, you choose Atkins 20, Atkins 40, Atkins 100, and uh, Atkins 20 is basically, the numbers are basically just how many grams per day of carbohydrates that you get. And of course they're promoting it as the original keto diet, uh, which would be 20, 20 grams per day um, and the keto the idea behind this uh, keto idea is you're putting your body in a state of uh, a ketotic state um, because uh, basically what happens is when you're not consuming as much carbohydrates your body will burn uh, carbohydrate for fuel and it'll also burn off the storage of carbohydrates which is glycogen in your liver and muscles and so once that occurs, then it will mobilize fat more for energy. And the idea is you're burning more fat. Um, and in the short term, that people do lose weight and um, do have some success with this type of diet. And so that's why it's promoted. I remember um, my grandpa going on this diet and, and he, uh, my pop up, and he actually would eat a lot of greasy meat foods. Uh, so it would, I just remember him doing that a lot. He said he would be going on the diet and he did lose weight. And it was a lot of, I guess, bacon and hamburgers. And you take the buns off the bread and everything. And, um, you know, this is how you, how you do it. So then we get to the zone diet in the 95. This was Dr. Barry Sears. And uh, he says there's a physiologic zone uh, or state when your body is optimally able to control inflammation. And those are the parameters there that he outlines. And the plate is the plate that you make is essentially a third protein, two thirds carbohydrates and a third fat. And you have the South Beach Diet, Arthur um, Agatson. He says it's a, on the website here, it says, it's a keto-friendly meal plan designed to follow the basic principles of keto diet. Low carb, high fat, but with higher flexibility. You have four weeks um, or one week plans, and you have to pay a price for those, of course. You get, I guess you get meals or you get a meal plan or something of this sort. So, um, yeah, but most of these diets, you see a similarity. They all involve low carb. Uh, and as we go down the list here, you'll see getting away from sugar and getting more to a keto diet. And uh, this continues. And then on her timeline, she lists this diet fit study, which, which found no uh, significant difference in weight loss from a low carb diet compared to low fat diet. So, um, Regardless, the fads continue. But I want to tell you today, actually, the truth about low-carb diets. There was a um, recent large-scale study published in The Lancet demonstrating that low-carb diets increase the risk of all-cause mortality. Um, and the idea is that it's most likely due to meat consumption. 
And uh, the reason for that is um, we know from the World Health Organization, actually, that they classify meat not just as possibly carcinogenic, but they actually classify processed meat as a known carcinogen to humans. So that would be like your processed deli meats, hot dogs, things like uh, this kind of processed meats with uh, something called nitrates and other um, preservatives and other factors they put in this meat. And then they say red meat is probably carcinogenic to humans. So there's a very high risk here of meat consumption. This is probably why there's in large-scale meta-analyses they're finding that there is an increased risk of all-cause mortality in these low-carb diets which tend towards um, higher protein, higher fat content diets. Um, and uh, also, uh, data has shown that each 50 gram portion of processed meat eaten daily increases the risk of colorectal cancer by 18 times. So pretty profound um, findings here. Also, animal-based foods increase heart disease risk. So let's look a little bit more at this study. This meta-analysis study was published in response to um, another study published, a, another large-scale study called the PURE study. I forget what it stands for, but basically it was took place over, um, they looked at multiple countries uh, on multiple continents with a lot of people, and they found that there is an increase in mortality with high carb diets. And so this study in the Lancet um, set out to um, understand this issue a little better. And so they did a, they put together a prospective cohort of people and they looked at um, carbohydrate on a continual scale. So uh, not just classifying into categories high or low, but they looked on a continuous scale uh, looking at carbohydrate intake, and then they did a meta-analysis as well, including their data. And um, so what they found was there's sort of this sweet spot for carbohydrate intake between 50 and 55 percent, where if you have below 40 percent, there's an increased mortality and shorter residual lifespan. In other words, a shorter amount of time remaining that you have remaining uh, to live. <laughs> um, and so the, um, they suspect that the reason for this is because it tends to be more, when you're eating these low carb diets, less than 40% of carbohydrates, of, or sorry, less than 40% of your total energy intake from carbohydrates, then you are eating a diet that is pro-inflammatory, biologically aging, and increases oxidative stress. Now, they did find that there is an increase in mortality with greater than 70% of your energy intake from carbohydrates. Um, and uh, this was sort of in line with that pure study that was published showing high carb diets increase mortality. But look, if you look at this graph, I mean, you can see um, how the it's obvious that mortality here, this is hazard ratio, um, the slope is a lot less on the higher carbohydrate side than it is on the low carb side. So you can see there's a, a um, there's a um, clear relationship increase in mortality the lower carb you get. And they suspect that the reason they found in the pure study data that higher carb diets increase mortality is because they may have primary lead in due to higher uh, intake of refined carbohydrates, which would be what we talked about last time. Diets that are high in refined carbohydrates that, that don't have as much fiber, um, like um, white breads, white rice, things like that. Okay. Now, the interesting thing was that
I think I may have lost the connection. I think we're back on. So um, anyway, the interesting thing was that there was one exception to this rule. And the exception was that low carb plant-based um, protein and fat sources actually showed lower mortality. So if you are going to consume a low carb diet, if you want to do that and you want to induce this ketotic state, actually, um, actually what you want to do is get the protein from plant-based sources versus animal sources. Uh, and so you could still do it that way if you really wanted to. Um, the other thing that I would want to mention is that you can induce this ketotic state with fasting. And that's why a lot of times people will do something called intermittent fasting. Um, however, this, um, if you do do that, the recommendation, see a, a lot of people that I, I hear that are doing this um, are actually skipping breakfast to do it. And that would not be ideal. You'd want to actually make your fast at night. So rather, if you eat a big breakfast, a big lunch, and then skip dinner, that would give you a 15 hour fast, um, at least there. Um, and so that would allow you to have that intermittent fasting period and still, um, get the health benefits because, uh, eating kind of a larger meal or, or your meals later in the day is actually not so good, not recommended. So, um, here is some more data which was published in the Journal of the American Medical Association, and they looked at the risk factors um, in this country um, of death. And wouldn't you know it, top of the list is dietary factors. They say that dietary factors, and look at this, dietary factors is higher than tobacco use. <laughs> on the list. Look how low physical activity. Physical activity is important, but look how high dietary risk is uh, on this this um, graph here. 529,299 deaths in 2016 related to dietary risk factors. And 83 or 80, about 84 percent of that was related to cardiovascular disease and 16 percent was cancer, diabetes, and others. Um, and then this is disability adjusted life year. So this is about basically how long you live with disability and dietary risk is still up there high on that, um, uh, on this, um, chart here. What were the dietary factors they looked at? Well, it was whole grain and fruit intake. Yes, that is it. <laughs> um, that was the main thing that was low in these individuals. Look at this, or this is the um, actual um, breakdown of what they looked at. And you can see um, under consumption of whole grains was the highest contributor to disability adjusted life years here. And fruit was right under that. So under consumption of these two things. Um, and, and we live in a society where it seems like Carbohydrates are being, um, uh, you know, it's almost like you can't consume carbohydrates because um, it's going to injure your health or something. Now we have to just look and understand that it's not necessarily carbohydrates, but maybe the type of carbohydrates. You know, you don't want to consume the refined carbohydrates. You want to consume more whole grains. Um, and so... Uh, you know, that's what we want to do. And then overconsumption of processed meat uh, and sodium was a major contributor here um, to disability adjusted life years. So let's transition and talk a little bit about how you can optimize your health with your diet. And we'll do that first by looking at um, what do 
what are dietary characteristics of the world's longest living people? And National Geographic teamed up um, with some others, I guess, and they uh, looked at different locations in the world where people live the longest. And they called them blue zones. Uh, one of those zones is off the coast of Turkey in um, Icaria, Greece. And it says that um, it has some of the world's lowest rates of middle age mortality and dementia. Research links their increased longevity with their traditional Mediterranean diet, which is heavy in vegetables and healthy fats and contains smaller amounts of dairy and meat products. Um, so uh, this is something that is important. Um, more vegetables, healthy fats, and smaller amounts of dairy and meat products. My battery's running very low. Okay, Okinawa, Japan is um, another place. And in Okinawa, Japan, they have the longest lived women. Food staples like sweet potatoes, soybeans, mugwort, turmeric, and goya, or bitter melon, um, are some characteristics of their diet. Then we have um, Sardinia, and um, it's on this Italian island, the world's highest concentration of centenarians of men, which is those who live to be over 100. This population consumes low-protein diet associated with lower rates of diabetes, cancer, and death for people under the age of 65. Then, um, our very own in the United States, Loma Linda, California. They have the highest concentration of Seventh-day Adventists in the United States, and some residents live 10 more healthy years than the average American by following a biblical diet of grains, fruits, nuts, and vegetables. And we have Costa Rica. And they have the second highest concentration of male centenarians. Their longevity secret lies in the strong faith communities, deep social networks, and habits of regular low intensity physical activity. So here are some of the guidelines from these places that they came up with. Um, they found that uh, blue zone centenarians eat about two ounces or less of meat, um, less than five times a month. They reduce their dairy intake. Uh, this is monthly and then weekly. They slash the sugar. They consume only 28 grams of added sugar daily. Um, and I think we we saw last time, I think it was 34 um, teaspoons, if I'm not mistaken, daily that Americans are consuming. Um, they eliminate eggs, no more than three per week. And uh, they go easy on fish, fewer than 33 ounces up to three times a week. Um, they snack on nuts, about one to two handfuls a day. And they drink mostly water, seven glasses a day, other things in moderation. They uh, get a daily dose of beans, so they're eating half to one cup of beans per day. You gotta get your beans in per day. That's something that I recommend. Uh, I think it's essential for weight loss, especially, uh, is getting your beans. Um, and uh, high, beans are high in fiber. They have a lot of antioxidants, vitamins, minerals, protein. Very good food to eat. Um, and they go wholey whole. So they eat the whole um, foods, not highly processed foods. And they are 95 to 100% plant-based, meaning, uh, you know, nothing, nothing from... Uh, essentially no animal sources. And then uh, we look at another angle, um, look at this from another angle. There was major studies done at Loma Linda looking, it's called the Adventist Health Studies. Studies. There were, ser there were uh, different studies done, um, and the most recent I think was the Adventist Health Study 2. And they looked at large population of Adventists since they tend to eat more vegetarian plant-based diets, and they broke um, well, first of all, they found these associations with a vegetarian diet. They found that um, vegetarians had a lower BMI uh, in this um, population, a lower prevalence and incidence of diabetes, they had a lower prevalence of metabolic syndrome, 
lower hypertension, all-cause mortality, and in some instances, lower incidence uh, or lower risk of cancer. And so um, the Adventists are not all um, eating vegetarian, so that allows for you to um, study them in an interesting way because you can break them down by the type of diet they have. And since it was a the population had a large um, the study population was pretty large. I think it was about 90,000. And so they were able to kind of show the stepwise um, prevalence in diabetes decrease as you get more towards plant-based. Uh, so the non-vegetarians having the highest risk or prevalence, I should say, of, of diabetes versus uh, on here, the vegans. So, um, uh, very interesting results, kind of a stepwise decrease, the more plant-based you get. And uh, a separate group of about, uh, I think, 8,500 men from this um, group, they looked at long-term meat consumption uh, in a 17-year follow-up uh, when they were not, con um, those who were not diagnosed with diabetes initially, and then 17 later, 17 years later, they looked and they and they found that uh, long-term meat consumption had a 74% increased risk of developing diabetes. And so the question we ask is a lot of people sometimes, or I've heard people say before that uh, you know uh, you don't want to you don't want to get the sugar, you don't want to get the diabetes, so you got to um, avoid the um,